right, everybody, welcome back today. Exciting day. It's always an exciting day here in the podcasting room. But I got my friend Josh Culler here. We're going to talk about some real estate, but really marketing. Like I want to talk about, I'm going to really grill him here on marketing for your business, marketing you know, for your coaching program, marketing for just yourself and your own personal brand. Um, so let's let's get started. Josh, how are you, buddy? Man, I am super excited to be here. Thanks for having me, brother. Uh, honored to be on your podcast. Just oh, super you. excited, man. Cool. Well, let's jump right into it. How, like, you're a young guy. So when you got out of high school three years ago, like, what, uh, what'd you do first? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish, man. I, it, plus 10. It, it goes plus so 10. Crazy. Dude, I'm plus 30. So you're in good shape. Hey, that's all right. That's it. <laughs> hey, time's just number. But uh, yeah. it's, it, it, it's funny that you, like, we were joking about that, but it's gone by quick, man. I am now. Yeah. You and I were briefly talking before this, and I am now entering my 13th year of being in the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. um, I Right out of high school, I was driving forklifts in a warehouse and wanted yeah. a change of different job. Uh, one of my friends that I grew up playing basketball and baseball with when I was younger, his dad owned um, hundreds of rental doors in our market, Northwest Indiana, right outside Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, nice. He owns them in Chicago as well. And I hit him up and I was like, yo, I want to like... I have a little bit of like creativity experience. You know, I've done like video work in high school and stuff like that. And I'm like, Do you, is there anything that you could utilize that for? And he knew that I was a hard worker and that sort of thing, playing sports with me. And so um, he reached out to his dad. They they hired me and I worked with them for about six months and then uh, uh, stopped working there. And literally the next week I started working with Gary Harper. And really? He How'd was you find partners. Gary? Yeah, yeah. So and Gary was partners, with a couple other guys in a massive wholesaling organization here. David Richter, our good friend, yeah. was a part of that as well. And um, I became their marketing director after a, a few months. Gary and I, not saying that we started it, David, but we were doing virtual wholesaling in Michigan before it was sexy and popular. So yeah. we didn't coin it. We never, we never taught it or anything like that. But he and I, yeah. we, we realized we didn't like traveling. We didn't like going to right. see the houses. So we're in Northwest Indiana, right outside Chicago. We did about 70 deals our first year together. We were in charge of Michigan and Ohio. Yeah. And that's what we did. So did that for what, a few years. And then what year was that when you started started the virtual wholesaling? Yeah. Uh well, we so literally as soon as I came on, I mean, that would have been oh. that was a different market, dude. And you've been in it longer than I have, but I mean, you know the market around 2013, 14 mm -hmm. was yeah, all like you, I mean, we were getting properties by HUD yeah. auction MLS right. and we'd walk in at any given day and have a spreadsheet loaded with properties that we had under contract and the marketing was dispositions. That's all yeah. it was building buyers lists and selling them. And that's yeah. that man. Yeah, no, it was a different deal. People, people now just have no idea what it was like, mm -hmm. what it was like back then. I mean, you could just literally walk down the street and pick up houses, but getting rid of them Crazy. was really the challenge. So. And we never, and what was interesting about that too, is that we never did motivated seller marketing. Like it was, yeah. that's what people do today because that's right. the market we're in, but it was all building buyers list. That's really right. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's for me, that's why that we just got so good at Dispo because yeah. it, it, we put out some banner signs, sent out a few, you know, mm -hmm. a thousand mailers and get five deals. Like it was, it was crazy. The response rate back then. Yeah. Just Cause just, you know, maybe the market just wasn't quite as oversaturated, but sure. what, uh, How'd you get into like social media marketing? And now you're like the go-to guy, especially in the masterminds that we're in for, for people to, you know, I know you do a lot of YouTube stuff and a lot of content. Like, how did you make that transition? Yeah. And I would even throw um, something we're heavily into now is podcasting. Yeah. And that even goes back to the days before getting into social media was podcasting. Really? So G Gary and I had started a podcast with the organization we were a part of, and we were getting people internally on our staff to be on the podcast to be guests on the podcast mm -hmm. that sort of thing it was very rigid very like new to us like podcasting was not like this big deal that everybody had a podcast now you know nowadays yeah. and that sort of thing and even social media was just starting to get its grounds so right. a lot of what we were doing was before social media it was just content so it was a lot of written type content to drive seo performance and at the time okay. we started running a little ppc right when it was kind of like kind of the sweet spot of ppc but we were very heavily focused on SEO and then doing a lot of video. So a lot of the video was based on um, loading them into YouTube. Then we send those to our buyers list and help, you know, kind of curate them, that sort of thing. We were using video somewhat for recruitment as well, but then also a little bit. We, I say we didn't do any motivated subtly marketing. We did a little bit of it and we leveraged video to, to do that. So that kind of got me broken into it. 
Mm-hmm. And there was a few other things that we were like, I was having to write copy and take photos for uh, yeah. you know, Craigslist postings and stuff like that. Like, uh, you know, back in those days. And then yeah, that yeah. just kind of evolved over time. So, wow. So your main goal then was just building like the, the company for the disposition side. Is that what the, what yeah. you, when yeah, you got started? Yeah, it was, it was that. And, you know, we did a lot of stuff that was like um, basically teaching other buyers how to work with us the best. Oh, okay. That was kind of the, the frame, the, the, the framing of the content. Yeah. In addition to that, we also, and I tell people this today as well, that when you're putting content out, frame it as a resource. And that's mm-hmm. what we were leveraging it for as well. So right. when we would do a video to our buyers list, you know, yeah. we would, we had our buyers list segmented into very specific buying criteria. Yeah, um, we would push out video, create video for like this group of five people that were in this segment. And then really? we did the 10 people in this segment. And that was what we focused heavily on and it worked really, really well. So. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So that, I like that. That's, I mean, I had segmented buyers lists and I feel like we were one of the first people to do like video walkthroughs back in 2010 and 11. Like with we were starting to do that too. Yeah. 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 And then, but, but to actually break it down even that far is, is pretty amazing. We, we call them the, <laughs> we call them virtual tours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Virtual tours. Right. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah. Like mainly, you know, my marketing when I was doing these things where I got really good at good descriptions and giving the buyers all yeah. the information and, and the yep. videos because I, I just was tired of taking dumb calls. Yeah. Hey, you sent this property yeah, out. Exactly how right. many bedrooms? Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. How do you know? How do you how do you ask those questions? Right. So I just got yep. so tired of how many square foot or, you know, what size is the lot? So I just, you know, just out of necessity, just from taking dumb calls, you know, that was the, the driver for me in the very beginning. We had our core like eight items i think it was eight items if i remember right that any piece of marketing that went out to a buyer about a Mm -hmm. specific property that we were um selling there was those eight things you know price was number one price was like because obviously like the thought process was the you know uh gary's uh brother-in-law wayne schaefer was the ceo of our organization um and his thought process was like well you know when i drive by a car lot and i'm looking at cars what catches my attention the like directly after I see the car, sure. what's the next thing I see? Normally it's the big sticker price on the window that uh-huh. I see. And that's what attracts me to like even have any kind of interest in it. And that was the thought process here is like, good deal, good deal, mm-hmm. good deal. That's that's the thought process of putting the prices out there. So that right. was big, you know, the biggest thing. Then obviously it was bad bath square footage, acreage, yeah. if there was any, like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was a core eight things that we would put on every piece of marketing material that would go out to a buyer. So there was never any questions. And exactly for that reason, it was to avoid the stupid calls and the wasted times and stuff. They just, it seemed to to never end, especially when I was taking all of the calls for the whole business. Right. Where are you at on the uh, highest and best and give me, you know, trying to run the price up. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I never loved it. I'll be honest with you. You didn't? No, I I mean, it was okay. (laughs) <laughs> I think because I was a buyer and I was buying my own rental so much too, that as a buyer, it just really pissed me off. And uh, I always thought, you know, hey, this is my price. If I get it, great. If I happen to get two people, then I'll do a highest and best. But but I would never just really try to artificially run people up. No. This wasn't my thing. What we, the way we would frame it with our sales team was you, like, if we got an offer, we would say that offer will expire in 24 hours if we get a better offer in that time frame mm. then we will let you know and you have a chance to come back up on that and every offer will last 24 hours so sometimes it was like it wasn't like it was a bidding war but it was also yeah. like we want to make sure the buyers knew like there are other people interested in this so make sure you do give us your highest and best when yeah, like you're, you're making that offer so it was kind of an ethical way we felt to go yeah. about it you know i get it so you did that for what, like eight years? You were, you were uh, in there. Yeah, se- seven and a half, eight years, something like yeah. that. And it was uh, from that time frame when I started to the time frame that I went full time into what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been in business doing this for five years now. So yeah. it's it's been a lot of fun. So going what on, going on that, thirteen years. <laughs> what made you make that transition from from kind of the active side to more of just the provider and and you know yeah. the media stuff? Yeah, obviously what I'm doing today was pretty much in a nutshell what I was doing mostly for the organization I was a part of. Mm -hmm. We had started a mastermind together and I was at one point in charge of running that, but I also ran all the media to build that up. And we we built that up to about 40 members at one point, 40 paying members. And it was uh, a really good mastermind. And then I was doing a lot of side work 
doing what I do now. A lot of video, on-site video shooting, um, yeah. a lot of strategy sessions, managing socials, managing podcasts, stuff like that. And I was just kind of like, you know, at the time I was single, uh, like not married, me and my wife yeah, yeah. were dating at the time. So I had a lot of time to be able to allocate towards building that side hustle. Mm -hmm. And then eventually got to a point where my side hustle was eclipsing the income I was making at gotcha. my full-time position. And I made the decision. I, and Gary was actually the first person I talked to about, you know, going full-time and what it took. Cause at the time he had started sharper right. um, a couple years before I did. And, uh, yeah, so right around, I would say it was like right around the end of 2018, got married in October of 2018, right around yeah. November, it started ramping up big time. March of 2019, I went full time into it. So Wow. What was your original plan when you, when you decided to go full time? Like what was the vision? The vision was really, I'm a very, I think, I think you know this about me and this is probably why you and I align so well from like a core value standpoint is I am a very um, like lifestyle driven business owner. Like yeah. there's a, there's a core four or five things in my life that are a priority to me. Money is not one of them. Money is only the simply the tool or the driver to achieve those things that I'm trying mm -hmm. to achieve. And um, time freedom is one of those. So I knew early on and getting to sit, I keep bringing up Gary, but he's obviously one of the biggest influences in my life. Um, getting to sit in an office with Gary for six, seven years really taught me a lot about delegation, taught me a lot about being a good, good leader, um, yeah. growing a team underneath me so that, you know, I'm not wasting time on $10 an hour tasks and I can focus on thousand dollar an hour tasks. Mm -hmm. And that is where my mind went directly. As soon as I started running the business, I hired my first full-time employee three months into the business wow. and that's not normal for people, but I highly yeah. valued. I was willing to take a little bit of a pay cut to hire that person because I knew there would be growth as you, you know, right. sustain it that way. So yeah, no, I think that's great. It took me a lot longer to learn all of those lessons. <laughs> I, I had the shortcut. Yeah, it was it was just yeah. being around the people that I was around, man. That's really yeah. what it was. So yeah, no, I was here in Chattanooga, kind of by myself with my brother, mm -hmm. and you know, I was like, I can do everything. Nobody's smarter yeah. than me. I, I had to learn it all the hard way, and now. Thank God I'm on the other side of that. Just <laughs> yeah. An amazing team that does cool stuff yeah. that allows me to come in here and, and uh, shoot the breeze with you in the middle of the day. For sure. Um, cool. So you've you've grown fast, man. Color Media. It's just like it's blowing up. You're you're like the go-to guy for sure. And like Family Mastermind for anybody that doesn't know what that is. That's sort of a collection of all of the coaches and influencers and providers, software providers for the real estate industry. And like you're the guy. You're the guy. How how'd all that happen? Um, again, dude, I, I, I have to credit it to being around the right people. Um, yeah. there was a couple of, uh, really big players in our industry that I got latched onto early on in my career. Of course, it doesn't have to be said again, but Gary was the first one. And at that time yeah. he was still in growth phase. He still wasn't mm -hmm. like super big Gary, the way he is now yeah. like, sharper just works with almost every real estate, you know, person out there. Um, yeah. So he was still growing, but he had looped me in with a couple. The, the first person that I really got looped in with that blew me up was John Martinez. Yeah. Um, and then he connected me with Mike Hambright. And then Mike connected me with a bunch of other people. And then yeah. uh, I joined Collective Genius with Jason Medley and, mm -hmm. you know, got looped into that entire group. And then Matt, I met Matt. Yeah. Actually, um, I was at a uh, event with Don Costa who okay. I was introduced to him by John Martinez. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met Matt just, he, he, somebody at the event told Matt about me. Matt reached out literally that same day. Really? We were in Las Vegas and then mm -hmm. told me about Family Mastermind. Yeah. Family Mastermind, I spoke for the first time. Um, I think that was September of 2020, I believe. Wow. And, uh, and at the time, David, it was like, I mean, you know how big it is now. And it was like huge, man. of the size. I don't actually. even know that I want to get up there and speak now. There's it's so crazy. Many so yeah. I spoke and really talked about how I run and operate the business, how we're able to, you know, create as much content as we do and that sort of thing. Our processes literally showed people how we do what we do. Right. And I came out of that event with an insane amount of clients. Now, obviously, um, you know, it just doesn't have to be said that the right people will get you to the right places. Sure. And there's been a time, man, I, I, this is a lesson learned. There's been a time out and it was pretty recent where I took a little bit of a hiatus and just was kind of like 
chilling and not really like making a lot of connections and that sort of thing, just coasting. And yeah. it hurt the business. It like, I, st- yeah. I, I wasn't getting leads. I wasn't getting new clients, yeah. that sort of thing. And I re-engaged, started building relationships again and started going to events again and that sort of thing. And yeah. What do you know? Like it's right. <laughs> it's right. I mean, yeah. Just, if you, if you do the thing, the thing works, but I mean, I, yeah. you know, I, I think that just, you know, the life, the life cycle or, you know, the lifestyle of being an entrepreneur is my God, you can't have the gas all the way down all the time. You no. just, you just, it'll just burn you, absolutely burn yeah. you out. Even, even running a good team and having people that are doing things for you. Just sometimes you just need to go in a, you know, even a short season of just, I just need to rest and recoup. You know yeah. what I mean? I just need yeah. to, need to recharge a little bit and refocus and get my kind of creative stuff going again. So, so I yeah. can see that, but I can almost tell, like I saw you putting, making some posts and mm-hmm. I saw that you were, I could just, I could tell, I could tell yep. that you were back at it. Yep. Re-engaging, uh, started, yeah. started back up my REI marketing weekly podcast that you are on. Yeah. Um, started up another podcast that is more, uh, you know, self-focused, self-development focused. Mm-hmm. And then um, just getting back into the groove of making high level connections with people. And that, yeah. Ultimately, for my business, especially as a service provider, it, connections are everything. You like, you want yeah. the right clients, you know. Sure. Yeah. No, we're we're exactly the same. Mm-hmm. So you've done a lot of podcasts. What are uh, and this is probably a selfish question. Like, how? What's the best way to to get your podcast out there and in front of a million people? Like for everybody that wants to wants to be the podcasting person. Man, so you're asking if somebody was starting a podcast and they wanted, yeah, to yeah, because there's. It. Yeah, I I, because I feel like every day somebody new is starting a podcast. Somebody, somebody in a Facebook group, they want to start a podcast, and I think it's great. Personally, I think there's there's a lot of great information out there that needs to be shared. Like none of that existed in 2002 when I started. Mm -hmm. Like when I went full time in 2009, that was like Facebook's first year or something, right? So none of this, none of this was around back then. And you know, the only thing I had was going to the local RIAs and you know paying you know back then 150 dollars for a weekend class. So I think it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's it's not an earth shattering answer, and you yeah. uh, being at you know taking taking social media and podcasts as as seriously as you do, you know that this is the truth. It's consistency. It's literally yeah. like everybody wants the secret sauce. It, it's it's hilarious <laughs> to me. It really is. Yeah. But and they're just not willing to stay consistent and do the work. They think that oh well, David Olds gets he's got two hundred thousand followers on Instagram and. Um, he's only been posting for a couple of years. Like I could do that. I could shortcut that and get, get that done in like two months. Like, <laughs> it's not how it works. It, I and I've literally had people say that exact, yeah. like kind of framing to me. And, and honestly, yeah, a couple of years, I feel like I got lucky. Like I, I really did. Yeah. I had a couple I mean, of things that hit and that's yeah. just what it was. Yeah. And, and a lot of, a lot of the way that social media and podcasts work nowadays, um, is just right timing. And with podcasts specifically, like it, so what I'll give you like informational wise is applicable to if you're doing social, if you're doing podcasts, if you're doing YouTube, but you asked specifically about specifically about podcasts yeah. and even more so than anything else. Podcast is one of those things that really hasn't changed that much in the way that it's delivered mm-hmm. over the course of the last 15 to even 20 years. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, J- Jason Hartman's a, a friend of mine and he's yeah. been podcasting for probably Forever. since like. It's I don't fine. know the early two thousands and um, Matt Terrio. Like, there's there's a few other like Joe McCall. There's a few other like longtime podcasters that have just been putting out over the you know, and they have thousands mm-hmm. of episodes out there. And the reality and the, and the truth of the matter is, especially with podcasts, um, if you stay consistent, pick your consistency. So if you're doing one a week and you think you can keep up with that, yeah. stay consistent with it. Then if you're like, well, I could I could probably manage doing six a month. Bump that up to six a month after you do it consistently mm-hmm. for three to six months. Yeah. It, you take it in steps as you go along. But I think where people kind of shortchange themselves is, and again, you know that this is factual, mm-hmm. is that they do it for four or five months. They're you know hot and heavy. They're ready to go. They're just like yeah. all amped up about it. They've got all their equipment. Maybe they build out the studio. And I've seen yeah. this happen. They spent twenty thousand dollars on a studio building it out. They get in the studio, record a bunch of episodes, and then crickets. You don't hear from them after six months. And there's a statistic out there, man, that um, is pretty interesting to me. Basically, if you look at the way that podcasts are released, so let's say a hundred people launch a podcast today, 
Right. In the next six months, 85% of those will not be publishing episodes. It's mind blowing to me. Like that it's, it's, yeah. it's crazy to me. And like most people, like if you start a podcast you, and maybe if you're listening right now, you started one <laughs> and you stopped it after a few months, then after that, once you ramp that up to about nine months, that number drops to like 95%. After wow. 12 months, it's like 99% of the pocket. So 99 out of 100 podcasts are no longer putting podcast episodes out after a year. Really? By just staying consistent for one year. You're in the top 1%. Top 1% of podcasts. Yeah. And people just don't understand that that's how that works. But I think the reason why people fall off just like with anything else is- yeah. Number one is they don't have key direction. They don't really know why they're doing it. It's not returning ROI for them. You and I know we probably hear that term a lot. They may not have the personnel to help them manage it. Mm -hmm. And they may not have the proper expectations. They may be like, well, I only got 100 downloads on this episode this month. Uh, buddy, that's only your second episode you put out. That's <laughs> Dude, you're doing good, man. Just you're doing decent. So yeah, you hear I, Gary V, Hermosi all talking about the same yeah. thing. Like, dude, I got three downloads my first podcast. It's yep. okay. And that That's was my crazy. mom. <laughs> and one thing that Hermosi has said, I've seen it on a couple of videos that he's put out that he said, like, just like with anything in business, he was specifically, he, I think he gave a keynote speech at a Think Media event. And he was talking specifically about his content. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, a lesson that I've learned early on was that sometimes we're doing like the right things. We're just not doing it enough. To yeah. me, I look at it as giving yourself enough at bats. So again, with your capacity in mind, I'm not saying put out one podcast episode a day, because if your capacity can't keep up with that, you're not going to stay consistent. You're going to burn out and then stop doing it. Yeah. So, but obviously like ramping that up is important, but I think knowing why you're doing it in the first place, have, it needs to be leveraged as marketing because have the expectation. It's not going to make you money. It's not, it's not a moneymaker. It is a marketing source. And then figure out why you're doing that. Set your proper expectations, do the work, stay consistent with it. And then yeah. you're going to be okay. I think that's where a lot of people struggle. Um, yeah, what's the ROI, right? Great, mm -hmm. I'm doing these podcasts. I've got this equipment. Like, yep. where does the return come in? I think that, you know, because a lot of us are business owners and entrepreneurs and things like that, that like they just get, they have a hard time grasping that, right? Because yep. we're so yeah driven and here's how much I paid for marketing and here's, you know, here's all the things. And But yeah, the, the social media, the podcasting, it's just very difficult to, to quantify that way. Let, let's let's do something real quick, David. Uh, yeah. I'll put you on the spot. All right. You tell us how much money, dollar amount wise, has the podcast brought in for you? Man, I don't know, but I do know that when my sales team takes calls, they're like they yeah. they they know exactly who I am. Yeah. They 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 see me on here. They see us talking about deals. They know that we're real real investors. They know what our company does. Like they know. They yeah. just know. Yeah. So that's to me. That's where the value comes in. For it's sure. curation. It's mm -hmm. it's authority building, and yeah. it's like you know. It to me, I look at it as like this is this right here. This podcast is a twenty four hour salesman for you. It's yeah. basically a piece of content that's going out there and building reputation and rapport. And as a marketer, a lot of marketers like to use like brand awareness as like this yeah. thing. But it's that that phrase has been devalued so much over the last few years because it's normally an automatic cop out for not getting results, but results are super subjective, which is why I tell people focus on why you're starting it in the first place. Because if you don't know what that is, you're not gonna be able to track it, make adjustments because for like a great example that I use David is, you know, let's take, for example, um, you start putting out social media and you're an active wholesaler. And the purpose mm -hmm. of it is to generate motivated seller leads to bring you deals and you close deals, make money, right? So let's say for instance, you put out one video, it gets 100,000 views and brings in zero leads. And yeah. on the outside, you might like, and it's gonna be hard because you're gonna be like, wow, that video popped up, that's gotta bring in something. <laughs> and then on the outside, your friends are like, yo, this video went viral, this is super cool. Like, yeah. job with that. But you know, deep down, it didn't generate any money for you. But then on the mm -hmm. flip side, Let's put a video out and it gets a hundred views, brings you two deals that are $40,000 wholesale rips a piece. Right Was it successful? You might have your buddies come out and be like, Hey, you're getting low views on your, your videos. You should step up a little bit. And you yeah. know, like, bro, I closed two deals off that video. I'm good. It's <laughs> all about knowing why you're doing it. That's exactly. important. Exactly. Well, I, I think you bring up an important point, you know, 
most of the people that are podcasting, this is not our only job, mm -hmm. right? We're out here, you know, if you're a wholesaler or you're a coach or, you know, software provider or provider like us at Easy REI Closings, like it's a challenge. So like, you know, what do we do to, to stay on track? Like, I, I know this is, and I'm kind of teeing you up here because I know this is exactly what you guys do, but it's really hard. You know, even with doing my videos and the guy who shoots me, like sometimes he's got to be like, come on, man, we got to do 10 more videos. We got to, you know, it's just challenging and you need, you know, part of it's an accountability partner, but just right. somebody really to keep you on, on track. And, you know, this is what you said you want to do. This is what you committed to. This is what you paid for. Let's get this done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, my, I will tell you, tell you this, just from being the service provider that we, you know, the, the services that we offer, my most, and we are 100% on the organic side. We don't do pay yeah. traffic at all. Yeah. My most successful clients, and it's easy for, for me to say, but my most successful clients are the ones that have been with me the longest. Right. And I, when, you know, when I'm working with people, like if you, if you're listening right now and you wanted to work with me and you hop on a call with me, you're going to hear me say this. I'm going to say, my contracts with you are month to month, but I do ask for a verbal six month commitment. Cause if you're not willing to work with me for six months, just don't work with me. Not yeah. saying it takes that long, David, to get results, but if you're not committed mentally to sure. put out for six months, then just don't start at all. It's not even worth it because right. the, with the way that organic content work with works with podcasts, social media, YouTube, you have to stay consistent over a long period of time. And of course, doing the fundamentals right, the execution. Yeah, yeah, that's all given. But there's no secret sauce that's like not already known to people. Yeah. You shoot shoot good video, you start the video with a, a hook, with yeah. a bold question, something that's gonna grab attention, make sure you deliver value throughout the, the video, give a call to action at the end, yeah. bada bing, bada boom. Like that's literally all you need to do. De decent camera, like nowadays you got your phone, like it's acceptable Jeez, yeah. and then you work up from there. It's, yeah. it's simple. Dude, I saw the new GoPro. It is the most clear thing I've ever yeah. seen. It's like in, what is it, 5K or something. I saw it the other day. I was like, my God, it looks like a damn IMAX camera now. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that's, it's simple. Like, pe yeah. again, people want to hop into building out a $20,000 recording studio in their office. And I'm like, oh, hold on. If you can't shoot video, like, in your existing office for a couple months and stay consistent with it, what yeah. makes you think? And then they're like, oh, it's going to hold me accountable. I'm like, <laughs> I've heard that story a thousand times. I promise you. You don't know how many offices I've walked into yeah. where they had a stack of Canon boxes from camera mm -hmm. gear and they were all unopened. Like oh. mm. ridiculous. Wow. So so somebody that because I know people are gonna want to reach out and talk to you. Like what are what are all the things that, that you do for people who are just even getting started, right? Maybe not even somebody who has like this big following. They're like just, hey Josh, I wanna I wanna get started. I, I know I have to build my brand. You know, my brand is the currency of the future for sure. And it yeah. is like let's yeah. not all be confused. Yeah. So the first place I would send people to would be my podcast. So we have a great podcast called the REI Marketing Weekly. We just relaunched it. Uh, last week we were in the middle of July or, or uh, beginning of July right now. So I'm not sure when this episode goes out, but, uh, mm -hmm. you, by the time you get over there, you are going to be able to hear an episode with, uh, our good friend, David Olds here <laughs> on that podcast. So you'll be able to listen to that. We're going to be putting out two episodes a week. One is just me solo episode, mm -hmm. um, giving you tips on all things, video content, nice. uh, content marketing, social, and how to leverage that. But that podcast is specifically for real estate investors looking to up their marketing game. It's literally exactly what it's called. So right. you can find that on any podcast platform. And the cool thing is, is that we already had that going for a couple of years and have about 150 episodes that are there oh. already that you yeah. guys can dig into. So feel free. Um, the next place is if, uh, David, any of your audience wanted to um, reach out to me, I'm more than happy to provide my email address. But you could also... Find me on any social media. I'm verified on all platforms. Just look mm -hmm. my name up, Josh Color. Yeah. It'll come up. I'm going to be wearing a hat. That's <laughs> guaranteed. So just look that up. You'll find me there. Send me a direct message. Say David sent you, and then you'll be able to find me. But my email address is josh at color, C-U-L-L-E-R, media.com. Nice. Well, awesome. So tell me about the sneakers, man. I got, I, I had it in my note. <laughs> I, I see you posting all the sneakers. Tell me tell me how you got into that. Like, how did that oh, become dude. Important? Oh man, I did not think I was going to be hopping on your podcast to talk about sneakers. Ooh, let's but talk about it. You just got me excited. I, I sat forward like I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, that's something you're passionate about. So I've been a sneakerhead for, geez, it, it's definitely been since middle school. 
Really? Um, I was always the, like, when I was growing up, it was the mid-2000s, so it was the days of early LeBron, Iverson, uh, Kobe, Mello. I didn't get to, I'm from Chicago, but didn't ever get to see Jordan play. Mm. Um, but obviously, like, a big stamp around here was Jordan sneakers. Like, everybody had them. Everybody had, like, one or two pairs that they repped and just, like, yeah. completely, like, wore every single day. Um, I got into it pretty early on and I'm the type of person that I like to like not go with the flow and do what everybody else is doing. So I'd always get like the different types of sneakers that nobody was wearing. Right. Um, so that kind of developed and I've always been that way. I have a crazy collection in the other room of my sneakers. My wife happens to be a sneakerhead too. So that's fun. That, um, that works out. Otherwise, yeah. she might not be so happy with it. Yeah, exactly. So it, one, one side of the room is my shoes. One side of the room is hers. Oh, wow. <laughs> But um, that's a lot of fun, man. And and uh, recently, uh, it would have been, it's almost going on a year now, but about the end of last August, so August of 2023, mm -hmm. I started finding like really good, way and I've always had hookups to get mm -hmm. like the sneakers that are hard to get a hold of, but I found a really, a couple of great ways to get really cheap sneakers. And I, 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 I've sold my own sneakers before. Like maybe I didn't wear them anymore. And I'm like, right. I just get rid cause I wear all my shoes, mm -hmm. um, regardless of how much they cost. So I found a couple sources to be able to source really good sneakers and then sell them. And then I ramped that up like pretty quickly. And now I have about 400 pairs of sneakers in my basement. I, oh my God, after dude. this podcast, I'm going to be going to drop off about 10 packages of sneakers that sold the last couple of days. So yeah. It's a little side hustle. It's a lot of fun. Though. That's cool. Like, <laughs> that's well. That's awesome because you because you love it. What's the most expensive pair of sneakers you've worn? The most expensive that I um, have, I, I will say that I purchased are okay. a pair of Travis Scott Lowe's. They're the Phantom ones, the all black ones. I actually, wore them at Family Mastermind last event. Oh, um, nice. Those are pretty cool. I'm not a big Jordan One fan, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like I think that they're little overrated i think they go with everything they're a great sneaker i think one of their all-time greatest but i personally like i don't find them comfortable and that sort of thing but those ones i really wanted so i grabbed so are them. you strictly nike it's all it's all about nike. no no oh, okay. uh, early early on because so i played basketball in high school growing mm -hmm. up and it was like the center of my life for four years and all my friends wore Nike, like all the, the, the gear that we had was all Nike. So in high school, I wore a lot of like almost all Nike and I, and one was a really big uh, brand back then in the two thousands street ball organization. And they kind of make, made a reemergence, uh, reemergence over the last couple of years. Um, I had a few of those, but most everything was Nike. And now I'm pretty like right now I've got a pair of new balances on, like, this is one of my only pair of new balances. Okay. All right. And these are pretty sick. Like, yeah. you know, I, the, the new, what's interesting, David, is like sneakers are very, a very interesting market because yeah. it's not all just based on what they call hype. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I've learned a lot of business in, in this process too. But the reemergence of kind of like 2000 style running sneakers with like the yeah. chrome hits and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that's made a really big comeback over the last year or so with New Balance, with Nike. Right. Every brand now, if you walk into any store, is going to have some form of a 2000s looking running sneaker. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. It's it's interesting seeing the way that these cycles work. And then the way that like buying and selling works, it's similar to real estate. You make mm -hmm. the money when you buy. If you can buy the sure. if you can buy the sneaker at a right price, you can yeah. profit a really, really like 100 to 200 percent of what your purchase price was. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you don't buy it right, you could lose money. <laughs> so. So, so I'm like fascinated by the sneaker thing. So I'm glad we got to talk about it. I know. Like certain it's sizes. Super fascinating, dude. What's that? It's super fascinating to me. Yeah, like that's yeah, why I went like, so deep into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there like certain sizes that you buy, you stay away from? Like what? But I would, I mean, even like a 14, like some dude, dude out there wants a pair of cool 14s, right? Dude, I love big sizes. Okay. And it's because they're really hard to get a hold of. Yeah for like all retailers. So yeah. great example is yesterday I went sourcing a little bit and I bought a pair of um, uh, basketball sneakers that are size 18, big, oh my God. big boys, like <laughs> bigger than my, like for like my elbow to the top of my hand. Oh my God. And they sold this morning. Like I got them yesterday, they sold this morning and I profited about $90 on that sneaker. I paid yeah. roughly 40 and it's like those sell 
instantly and it's because like they're just really hard to find especially depending on this like especially if you get any kind of a jordan typically yeah. if you go to nike's website and a jordan's released go down to the sizes and mm -hmm. scroll all the way down past like size 15 and down normally they're sold out really so it's interesting just, yeah because they probably don't make a ton of them because you would yeah you would yeah. think that so like my foot size is a 10 and a half that's the most common foot size in in male. okay and Normally they'll sell out pretty quickly, but they're still easy to get a hold of because they manufacture those and the quantity of those is a lot more than the bigger sizes or even the smaller sizes. But they'll still do smaller sizes, especially in men's shoes, more because they can fit women's feet. And it's mm -hmm. very common for men and women to wear, like, you know, especially sneakers, you know, men to get women's pairs of sneakers or Jordans because there's a certain colorway, but it was a women's exclusive and yeah, you know, vice versa. So wow. it's interesting. Fascinating. I love it. I love it. And I, I do, I watch all the posts and all the sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> you so see everything cool. that comes out. Let me know if you, you know, ever see something like send it to you. I, I follow it all, man. I follow it all. <laughs> well, guys, awesome episode. Josh, thank you so much for being on. I yeah. want to make sure everybody knows where to find you. Josh Color, you're on Verified on all the platforms, yep. which, is, which is awesome, easy to find. But if you are looking to get serious about your you know, social media and podcasting game, um, definitely reach out to Josh. I can tell you he is 100% the real deal and uh, just a good guy and obviously loves his sneakers. So uh, with that, any any final words or we're good? No, just say if you guys reach out to me, again, say David sent you and I will hop on a call with just about anybody to give it all to you and let you know what you need to do. So just reach out. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you.